Board members, please speak directly into the microphone in front of you and have it on only when you want to speak. And please ensure that your video on your laptops is always on, but your audio is disabled. Okay, thank you, Ashley. Uh, so let's start the meeting. Welcome, everyone. My name is Jacinta McCann, and I'm the chair of the BCDC's Design Review Board. I'm located here at the Metro Center in San Francisco, and our meeting will include participants who are here and those who may be participating online, although I think we have everyone here, which is terrific. Our first order of business is to call the roll. Board members, please unmute yourselves to respond and then mute yourselves again after responding. Ashley, can you call the roll, please? Chair McCann. Present. Vice Chair Strang. Present. Board Member Battaglio. Present. Board Member Hall. Present. Board Member Pellegrini. Present. And staff t attending tonight are myself, Ashley Tomerlin, Yuri Jewett, Catherine Pan, and Shruti Sinha. Okay, very good. Uh, we have a quorum, so we are constituted to have the meeting. Uh, so thanks, Ashley. Uh, let's uh, start with some instructions, and I'm going to read them because they're quite long. Uh, so I want to share some instructions on how we can best participate in this meeting so that it runs as smoothly as possible. For everyone who's participating online and in the meeting room, please make sure you have your microphones or phones muted to avoid background noise. For board members, if you have a webcam, please make sure that it is on so everyone can see you. For members of the public, if you would like to speak during a public comment period this evening, you will need to do so in one of three ways. Uh, for members of the public who are attending our meeting in person in our headquarters building, please complete a comment card found at the meeting room door. The board secretary will call you up to the podium for public comment. Wearing masks is optional, but recommended in this building. You will be asked to come up to the podium one at a time and to state your name and affiliation prior to providing your comments during the meeting. If you are attending on the Zoom platform, please raise your virtual hand in Zoom. If you are new to Zoom and you joined our meeting using the Zoom application, click the hand at the bottom of your screen. The hand should turn blue when it's raised. If you are joining our meeting via phone, you must press star nine on your keypad to raise or lower your hand to make a comment and star six to mute or unmute your phone. We will call on individuals who have raised their hands in the order that they are raised during the public comment period for each project. After you are called on, you will be unmuted so that you can share your comments. Please state your name and affiliation at the beginning of your remarks. Remember, you have a limit of three minutes to speak on an item, and we will tell you when you have one minute remaining. Please keep your comments respectful and focused. We are here to listen to everyone who wishes to address us, but everyone has a responsibility to add in a civil manner. We will not tolerate hate speech, threats made directly or indirectly, and or abusive language. We will mute anyone who fails to follow these guidelines or who exceeds the established time limits without permission. For online public comments, please note that we will only hear your voices. Your video will not be enabled. If you are attending the meeting in person on the Zoom, if, excuse me, if you're attending the meeting on the Zoom platform, we recommend using the gallery view option in view settings in order to see all the panelists. Audio for in-person panelists is recorded through the room's audio system and is not synced to individual panelists' videos. If you would like to add your contact information to the interested parties list to be notified of future meetings concerning these projects, please call or email Ashley Tomalin, whose contact information is on the screen and can also be found on the BCDC website. And finally, every now and again, you'll hear me refer to the meeting host, Yuri. Yuri is our BCDC and our BCDC staff are acting as hosts for the meeting behind the scenes to ensure that the technology moves the meeting forward smoothly and consistently. Please be patient with us if it's needed. And now the board secretary will provide a staff update. Thank you, Chair McCann. I do have a couple of updates tonight. First, an update on the board member recruitment. The selection committee has been busy over the last few months working on identifying candidates to recommend for the board and alternate openings. 
We received 17 sets of qualifications and interviewed 10 candidates for the four openings. The committee has the following recommendations for appointment. Leo Chow of SOM for the architect board member. Patricia Fonseca Flores, formerly with AECOM, ESA, and Linleaf for the landscape architect alternate. Ganit Anand of SiteLab for the urban design alternate. And Cody Anderson from Sherwood for the engineer alternate. We will be giving the recommendations to the chair of the commission for concurrence at the May 18th meeting and the new appointees should begin their terms in June. Our next meeting is scheduled for Monday, June 5th, and will be a review of the Port of Oakland Middle Harbor Shoreline Park 7th Street connection. This was previously went to the board last October. Um, for newly reopened public access, the Breakwater Trail at Lock Roman Marina in San Rafael has recently reopened. The project raised the elevation of the trail two and a half feet to 9.5 and installed a 100 foot long boardwalk with bird viewing platform. Pro um, for project updates, we have three previously reviewed projects going to the commission for permits in May and June. Oyster Point phases three and four in South San Francisco, 557 Bayshore in Redwood City and 777 Airport Boulevard in Burlingame are scheduled to be presented to the commission in the upcoming meeting. That concludes the staff update. I'll pause here to answer any questions from the board. And if there are none, then we can move on to the next item. I'm just going to jump in for a minute for our board members. Uh, and I, first of all, just want to say thank you to Ashley and Gary. Um, Gary for uh, being on the interview committee with me and Ashley for organizing quite a series of, you know, complex, complex scheduling <laughs> to get everyone uh, uh, together for the interviews. Um, and uh, we had really high quality candidates. I just want to thank all of you for um, putting forward ideas uh, into the mix. And um, so I think, you know, we've got a, uh, a slate here of recommendation, recommended candidates that are really going to see the board through into the next uh, era of board members after those of us who roll off in coming years roll off. So uh, it was quite exciting to be able to have this caliber of candidates. Any comments from anyone? Okay. Well, anyway, thanks to you, Jacinta, for um, you know leading the charge, and we're super happy with um, how it turned out. And as Jacinta said, um, we've got a couple of people who are going to really shore up. Uh, you know, are going to bring a lot to this conversation. We're really looking forward to that being a deeper and richer. Um, so yeah, yeah, very happy about that. So actually, these will be likely approved, and the candidates would be, or these recommended candidates would be notified yet, or not yet. They have been notified. They stated that they were still interested in serving, and Good. so we brought the recommendations here, and then the recommendations will go to the commission on the administrative listings or the chair's report. So it's kind of there's there will not be a vote on it. Right. Okay. And so just thinking in terms of timeline, uh, we might be able to see the architect at our July, June, July, possibly June, but certainly July uh, board meeting. Yes, the terms are supposed to start in June um, yeah. and the June DRB is June 5th. So that might be a tight turnaround, but right. the July meeting, I would definitely want to have the architect on board. Yeah, excellent. Okay, good. Uh, so uh, we'll move to the next item on the agenda, which is public comments on what on the board secretary's uh, report. Uh, if anyone attending uh, online would like to make a public comment, please raise your virtual hand to speak and remember all of the guidelines that I just said before. Um, is there anyone raising their hand for public comment? We have no public comment. Okay, thanks very much. Good. Okay, that gets all of the administrative things out of the way, and we can uh, move to uh, the next agenda item, which is the first review of uh, B9 Island Parkway Life Sciences Development Project in Belmont, and uh, really appreciate seeing the team here in person, so thank you. Um, and we will begin our review on agenda item four now. Uh, it's the, it's the um, first review, correct? Correct. Um, 
of B9 Island Parkway development in San Mateo County. So we will be doing the following here in terms of the review. Uh, there'll be a staff introduction followed by the project proponent presentation, followed by board clarifying questions, then public comment, then board discussion and summary, and then a project proponent response, a brief response, uh, optional, but um, you know, always welcome. And with that, the BCDC permanent analyst, Shruti Sinha, will introduce the project. Uh, thanks, to, thanks uh, uh, Shruti, go ahead. Thank you, Chair McCann. We just need a couple more minutes. It's been a while. Thank you again, Chair McCann, and good evening, Design Review Board members. My name is Shruti Sinha, and I am a Shoreline Development Analyst at BCDC. Before I pre present the staff introduction, I would like to remind the project team and staff to please turn on your video when you are speaking or answering questions. When you are not actively engaged with the board, please turn off your video and mute your microphone so that you minimize distractions on screen. And now I'd like to introduce the project for tonight's review which is the redevelopment of a 12.6-acre former Oracle campus located at 300, 301, and 400 Island Parkway and 800 Clipper Drive. This project is proposed by developer Biomed Realty. Biomed Realty has submitted its application to the, the City of Belmont, received comments, and just recently resubmitted an update to their application. The City of Belmont will commence the CEQA environmental review process this spring. Tonight is the project's first DRB review. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the project area was once water and historic tidal flats located near Lamchin, the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramitush Olonu. We offer gratitude to the indigenous peoples who are the original stewards of the bountiful natural resources of the Bay Area. The project is located in the city of Belmont, just outside of the Redwood Shores waterfront community. It sits at the confluence of Foster City, Belmont, and Redwood City. It also sits at the confluence of the O'Neill and Belmont sloughs. The two sloughs wrap around the property surrounding the project site such that they create a moat-like enclosure of the area within. And this area is called Island Park by the project that developed the area in the mid 80s. The site is surrounded by office campuses, a hotel and a residential community to the north. To the southwest is the Belmont Sports Complex owned by the city of Belmont. Pedestrian and bicycle access to this so-called island is provided by three foot bridges circled in yellow along the south of Island Park. Also circled in yellow is the land bridge to the northwest of Island Park and the Bay Trail at the northeast. The only vehicular access to Island Park is provided via Island Parkway, a pile supported five lane bridge which crosses over O'Neill Slough from the south and terminates at the project site. 
Here's some regional context for public parks and trails. This map is taken from the Bay Trail Division of the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. The Bay Trail is shown in dark green. Note that no portion of the Bay Trail lies within the project site. This map doesn't show it, but there is a shoreline pedestrian path within the project limits. It's, it is an approximately 500 linear foot segment of what is locally called the O'Neill Slough Trail. This slide contains a few site photos taken by the applicants. Except for the public streets and a parking lot owned by the city of Belmont, the project site is unimproved for public use. Existing use of the site includes pedestrian traffic along the project's northwestern shoreline via the O'Neill Slough Trail and parking on the 400 Island Parkway parcel associated with events at the sports complex. The existing permit was issued to the Oracle Corporation. Although Oracle built out the buildings that exist today at 301, 401, and 501 Island Parkway, it did not construct the buildings authorized for 300 and 400 Island Parkway. Approximately half of the authorized project was never built out. Likewise, the public access conditions required by the permit seem to have only been partially fulfilled. Based on recent satellite imagery, it appears that some of the above mentioned public access requirements were implemented and exist today. Some were implemented and later abandoned and others were never implemented. Um, this slide, uh, I'll try to go through the several public access requirements in the existing permit to give you a sense of what the commission thought was commensurate with the type of development that would cover this area. So So these are the addresses. This is the, the shoreline band. This is the trail. It's a pedestrian path that was supposed to go all around the island. Um, and it's mostly built out in one way, in one form or another. Um, over 100,000 square feet of landscaping was also required, um, a raised turf area at the, uh, the cul-de-sac uh, on either side of Concourse Place, five foot wide bike lane on Concourse and Island Parkway, a five foot wide access path to the br bridge plaza public shore parking along Concourse Place and uh, 80 evening and weekend parking spaces in the 400 Island Parkway lot for, for uh, events associated with the sports complex. Two foot bridges across O'Neill Slough and Belmont Slough, 10 foot wide and eight foot wide And that appears to be it. And then uh, off to the side, there's sign. You'll see that there's signage, uh, lighting, picnic tables, benches, trash receptacles, and restrooms. Minimum uh, numbers for those required. So that was for the project was that was only half built. BCDC's community vulnerability mapping tool shows the majority of the project site as having moderate social vulnerability based on, based upon the 2014 to 2018 census data gathered by BCDC in 2020. The social vulnerability indicators in the 70th percentile for this census block include children under five years of age, single parent households, people who are not US citizens, and people who are severely housing cost burdened. 
regarding the potential sea level rise and regarding potential sea level sea level rise and using current site elevations, this map shows what 24 inches of sea level rise would look like if the site remained unchanged. We used the medium to high risk conversion scenario for the public access improvements. The bottom row shows what equivalent future total water level this map corresponds to for each risk scenario. For the medium to high risk aversion scenario, 24 inches of sea level rise is equivalent to the mean high high water level along with 2050 sea level rise, which would also not cause flooding on the site. This map shows what 66 inches of sea level rise would look like at the site if it remained unchanged. I shaded the project site in yellow because red represents overtopping, uh, according to this key. For the medium to high risk aversion scenario, 66 inches of sea level rise is equivalent to mean higher high water in the year 2090 or the 100 year storm events at mid-century. The San Francisco Estuary in Institute Adaptation Mapping Tool recommends existing and potential tidal marsh and polder management as nature-based as nature-based uh, adaptation opportunities. Lastly, I'd like to quickly summarize the questions in the staff report that we'd like the board to consider in your in its review. First, please consider how this project meets the public access objectives provided in BCDC's public access design guidelines. Then, staff has identified some specific questions we would like to ask the board about the design at this stage. These are, one, how does the project proposal result in public spaces that feel public? And does the project proposal allow for the shoreline to be enjoyed by the greatest number of people? Two, what additional improvements would improve the public access experience to and along the shoreline? Three, are the public access areas appropriately designed to be resilient and adapted to sea level rise and balanced with ensuring high quality public access opportunities? And four, does the design provide legible connections from the adjacent roadways and bike and pedestrian network to draw users into and through the site to the O'Neill Food Trail and Shoreline. At this point, I would like to check to see if the board has any clarifying questions for me on anything presented in this introduction. Sridi, yeah, I, I do. Could you go back to the, uh, the diagram that shows the permit or the permit requirements? Can you switch back to that? That's it. So I just want to double check. So when the permit was originally given to Oracle for development of this site, uh, the green area up on the left that it says 40,000, 47,000 square feet of landscape, was that part of the permit? Yes, that, that is required in the permit. That's in the permit. Yes. And then the second thing I wanted to ask was the line that delineates the 100 foot shoreline band, was that in the permit originally? Uh, it might have been in the exhibit, but uh, that that's an approximate that we put in. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it would have been discussed at the time, the 100 foot shoreline band was clearly in place at the time the permit right. was, yeah. So yes. it would be understood that any development approach proposal needs to follow the requirements for the 100 foot shoreline band and provide that 47,000 square feet of green space. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Any other clarifying questions? Thank you for the presentation. Um, I was wondering the boundary on the exhibit, does it it seems to include sometimes the parcel linking all the way to the Belmont Slough. Is that part of the site or is that not included? So this is the extent of the project that's being proposed today. Um, Biomed Realty actually owns, uh, you can't see my cursor, but 
uh, where it says 301 Island Parkway, that's part of the project, but Biomed Realty owns the the, the um, area, the campus south of that also. At Oh, it doesn't show the, the address. Uh, I believe it's 401 and 501. Yes, um, but that's not part of this project, okay. within the scope of this project. But all the areas shaded in red it, are uh, part of the project, including the, uh, there's this uh, little section, uh, this parking lot at the south um, next to the sports complex. That's a city-owned parking lot. And the uh, applicant is uh, part of their, it's part of their project uh, at, I, I believe is uh, part of their agreement with the city to um, uh, redevelop that, do some sur like surface redevelopment to that parking area. In some of the exhibits, it shows building one included in the boundary. In some of the exhibits you showed, I just want to confirm that's not part of the project. So if you flip forward a few slides, it shows it going all the way to Belmont School. Oh, one more. Like in this one. So that, that building's not part of it. Okay, just want to confirm. And then the other question, um, no, never mind. That's it. Thank you. So I have one question. Um, can you go back to the, <clears throat> excuse me, to the uh, permit drawing that you had up previously? Yeah, that's the one. So uh, on the uh, right, it shows a 10 foot wide Oracle footbridge across Belmont Slough. Mm -hmm. that, that doesn't exist, does it? It does. Oh, it does exist. Yes. Okay. So that's already been constructed. Yes, three right. foot bridges have been constructed. Um, the per this shows what's required in the permit, but so you'll see uh, one at uh, on the O'Neill side of the the slough, which is uh, required to be eight foot wide, uh, wo wooden pile supported foot bridge. Mm -hmm. That's been built, and then there's another one um, on that side. So that two on the O'Neill Slough side and then the Oracle uh, footbridge have all been constructed. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I have a question. Um, the sea level rise diagram that you showed, I just want to clarify, I understood that. At the 100 year storm, um, at mid century, the, this entire area in blue would be underwater, it would be over top. No, no. It's 66 inches. Yeah, maybe you could just run run me by that one more time. What is the condition mid-century 100 years storm? This is 2015. 2015 sea level rise plus 100 year storm. Okay, thank you. This is, is if that... the site remains unchanged, if nothing right. happens. Right, right. Well, I'm looking at the surrounding areas. Yeah. Yeah, I know we'll hear about the site shortly. I was kind of just wondering about the access road. Sorry to, um, sorry to backtrack, but can you go back to the uh, permitting diagram? Yeah, I, I just wanted to clarify those um, pictograms down the left-hand side, 
were they part of the permit as well? Yes. 24 benches, et cetera, et cetera. And two toilets, but does that indicate some sort of restroom? Yes. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, any other clarifying questions? All good? Okay. Well, Sridi, thanks very much for providing that information. It's very helpful. So we'll go to the next item on the agenda, which is the project proponents presentation. So um, we'll hand to who has presented. Thank you. Hello? Hi. All right, good evening. Everyone can hear me okay? Yes, very good. My name is Ethan Warsh. I'm a director of development with Biomed Realty. Um, just a, one sentence on Biomed. Biomed Realty is a leading provider of real estate solutions for the life science industry. Um, we, fo we focus exclusively on life sciences real estate. Um, so I want to take a moment and introduce my team. Um, I'm joined here tonight by Marcel Wilson with Bionic Landscape Architects, um, Jeff Smick and Ellie Necht with WRA, um, Cecily Barclay, our Land Use Council with Perkins Cooey, um, Cecily, and my colleagues Salil Payapili and Ashley Heerman, both with Biomed. Um, Marcel and I are going to be presenting um, our Island Park project to you this evening, uh, and others on the team will be available to answer questions. And so with that, I'd like to hand things over to Marcel. Good evening, um, nice to be here. Um, just to orient everyone, um, the Island Parkway Life Science Campus is located at, in, in Belmont. Um, it's adjacent to the 101 freeway. You may recognize the landmark of the uh, Oracle Towers. Um, it's surrounded uh, to the north by a hotel and a dealership. There's a residential community uh, close by and then a sports park to the south. Um, and then existing segments of the Emile Slough Trail uh, run to the north of the site. Uh, the project site is generally flat. It consists of mostly uh, disturbed, uh, disturbed area and compacted gravel. It's developed portions of the project include uh, existing office space and parking areas, um, tree, uh, street trees and landscape areas. Um, and aside from the public streets that the city owns, um, parking lot at the south end of the project site, the project location is currently not open to the public. However, people informally use the area to traverse the western edge of the property to connect the O'Neill Slough Trail um, and through, the, through a gap uh, through the site. And if you look at the image on the lower left, uh, you can see um, the, there's some carpeting that's been put down there by users to, to traverse this area. Uh, so this is, um, uh, and then there's another part of the site, which is a parking area to the south end, um, and uh, that is also in the in the hundred in the shoreline. Um, a variety of trails and infrastructure, uh, the bridges, there's a tunnel, um, converge on this site. 
uh, and their um, the conditions of those trails and their surfacing are all um, are all varied. The Bay Trail uh, is located on the east side of the island. That's the um, lines in yellow. The O'Neill Slough Trail is in green. It's not designated as Bay Trail, but it surrounds the rest of the perimeter uh, of the island, with the exception of the trail gap that crosses the 800 Clipper property, the dash line there. Um, this, uh, this is an identified um, gap, and uh, you can see the 100-foot setback is indicated in blue. Um, and so uh, along the slough, that's in the upper part of the drawing. And then on the lower part of the drawing, you see the area shaded in blue. That's the sports complex uh, parking lot, which also falls within the shoreline there. The um, future circulation here will be um, uh, bicycles and pedestrians, which are, will move along this kind of orange lines. The larger pink lines are um, for primary access to the, to the shoreline. And these circulation routes connect existing trail networks and provide users with site access to the rest of Belmont uh, and Redwood Shores and the Greater Bay Area. So uh, this is a, a, a this site can really act as kind of like a, a trailhead for a much larger, wider trail network, although it is not officially a bay trail. Uh, Ethan's going to walk through uh, the building program. Thanks, Marcel. So before Marcel walks you through the details of the shoreline design, I wanted to provide a broader overview of the project. Um, so the project I'm about to describe is what's included in our application to the city of Belmont and reflects months of close and ongoing collaboration with them. Um, so BMR is proposing approximately 860,000 square feet of life sciences space. It's spread across uh, three different buildings um, and one parking structure with ground floor amenity programming as well. Um, we call our buildings uh, Building 1 in the middle there, Building 2, uh, Plan North, and Building 3, Plan East. Um, building 3 includes podium parking, so it is uh, self-sufficient from that perspective, and the parking structure will serve Buildings 1 and 2, um, and also includes ground floor amenity programming um, directly adjacent to the uh, sports complex. Um, all of our buildings are shorter than the uh, highest point of the nearby Oracle campus. Um, and one detail I wanted to highlight is that the parking structure also includes 80 parking spaces available to the sports complex, sports complex users. And we are proposing an additional six spaces that are specifically designated for users of the trail system. And one other item I wanted to pause on that I wasn't planning on, um, just because our, the rest of the presentation doesn't cover it, um, and I saw it come up earlier, is the, the bike lanes. And so we are proposing significant bike lane infrastructure as part of the project. So that includes uh, protected class two bike lanes all the way down Island Parkway. Um, and then on Concourse Place, sort of connecting uh, both sides of the island, we're proposing a protected class four bike lane, as well as um, just painted class two around the residential portion. Um, so filling in all of the, you know, so it would be a very robust bicycle network on the island. Um, so this was covered briefly by Marcel, but this slide shows the BCDC shoreline band in relation to our proposed project in blue. Um, you can see that there are two areas of overlap. One, which is the primary subject of this presentation, is adjacent to our building two, Plan North. Um, the other is within the surface parking lot, Plan South. Uh, the, this parking lot is existing, owned by the city of Belmont and associated with their sports complex. We are not proposing a new use here, but the city has asked that we reconfigure their lot in order to streamline the access from the street. Um, and so it interfaces more coherently with our lot, which if you recall, they will also have access to. And so they really will uh, in many ways operate you know, for, the, for the same users. If you can't find a spot in the surface parking lot, you may want to jump over into the structured parking lot. Um, as a result of the reconfiguration, uh, the city will also gain an additional 15 spaces on the surface parking lot. They'll also um, will benefit from a much improved drop off area that the uh, city and sports complex users have specifically requested from us. So before I hand things back over, um, I would like to focus for one moment on the portion of the shoreline band that is adjacent to our building two. Um, this area of the project, and specifically the interface and proposed overlap between building two and the shoreline band is something that the team has spent a lot of time talking and thinking about. Um, while our proposal to include a portion of building two within the shoreline band is an allowable use, we also understand the importance of balancing that placement with the need to provide meaningful, attractive, inviting, and adaptable shoreline access. 
And so with that in mind, we approached this site, specifically this building two site, but you know, broadly as well, um, with and all of its constraints with a few objectives. Um, and so one is that, you know, we have an objective to build a building that is viable for our tenants. You know, our ability to build a campus that attracts high quality life science tenants is at the core of our business. Uh, and it's also what allows us to make the, all of these proposed improvements to the area. Um, two, placemaking and access. We believe that strong placemaking will make our project a success for our tenants, for trail users, for nearby residents and users of the sports complex and clear trail and sports complex access is central to our placemaking strategy. Um, and three, it, harmony with adjacent residents. So we, we do seek to build a project with an interface that makes sense given uh, the diverse other nearby uses, including residential. And so the proposed building two design, we think achieves those objectives in the following ways. The building design is viable for our tenants by providing a floor plate size, core design and layout and ground floor loading plan that supports their needs. Our proposal supports place, basic, place making by focusing on a well-designed ground plane and strong access to the shoreline trail and the sports complex for pedestrians, bicycles, and vehicles. And we do that a couple of ways. One is that we locate, um, we've located building two loading plan north. So along that Eastern, that top property line on the, on the map there, rather than between buildings one and two. Uh, and by doing that, the area between building one and two becomes a central access point for the shoreline sports complex and our buildings and taken together with adjacent spaces becomes a dynamic multi-purpose open space that really is uh, the central plaza of our campus. And lastly, to create harmony between uses, we've ensured with this design that trucks can access the loading area of building two without having to loop around the island through the residential areas, which is something that was important to us from the get-go. And so with that, I'll hand things back over to Marcel. Um, to talk about the improvements, uh, it makes sense to zoom way back and uh, talk about them from outside the site um, in the first. Um, currently, uh, there are views to the slough. Uh, you can see on the lower left corner of to, from Concourse Place, uh, there's big wide open um, view aligned to Concourse Place. Uh, and and to the slew. Um, new buildings uh, one and two are going to be sited, as you can see in the bottom right corner, uh, so that there's a very wide aperture and a sense of the bay beyond uh, is um, will be telegraphed to people passively as they use the sidewalks and uh, crosswalks to, to access the trail. Um, proposed uh, improvements of sidewalks, crosswalks, pedestrian safety, bike lanes will kind of be aligned also to these buildings, just sort of reinforcing uh, a kind of intuitive wayfinding for the access. Uh, these drawings illustrate a, 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 a kind of a, a visitor sequence uh, to the trail. You'd be able to access the trail from the north, the east, and the south. Um, so uh, O'Neill Slough is sort of interesting in its own right as a vestige of a much larger system. There's a lot there to explore. Um, I want to also just point out to you uh, in the plan drawing on the left, you can see that there's a bend in the trail. Uh, and, and we'll talk about that bend and how it relates to the sequence. So uh, in, uh, in the view one, you're um, all the way back, uh, looking down, down the, this kind of multi-purpose trail. It's at least 26 feet wide, paved the entire way, ADA accessible. Uh, and uh, the sports complex is on your left. And as you move uh, more closely in, in, in the second view, um, the tr you see this trail consistency stays as wide. There's amenities along the sides of the trail. View three uh, actually looks at it from uh, approaching um, on Concourse Place, big wide view to the bay. And view four uh, looks back at the sports complex where uh, you, again, you can see um, sort of the nature-based solutions to sea level rise on the, on the bank. I'll talk about a little bit more about that later and amenities to kind of stop and pause along the way. Um, it's at this point that you can, uh, in view five, uh, that you can see this kind of vertical element that we created at that turning point. Um, and it's a large frame, uh, it's meant to, in a, in a big deck, there'll be an observation point there. And it's really a vertical marker to indicate that the trail does move on uh, from either perspective from north or south. And it's kind of an invitation to, to 
continue through the trail and make it very clear that it's, uh, that it's public. Uh, this next set of views are, um, show a little bit more of the architectural character and give you a sense of uh, what the experience might be. So um, this is, is demonstrating just the, the kind of uh, uh, generosity of the street scape and, and uh, the kind of planting and massing of the buildings and the, the big wider views. As you, uh, this is on Concourse Place, looking west, the building on the corner, building one, have a more kind of an iconic presence. It is, uh, you know, and it, it sort of announces itself as the center. Uh, and then the, the, you look at the relationship between building one and two, big wide opening with the bay beyond, or with the slough beyond. This is looking from kind of the slough back to the east. This is the plaza where you would arrive. This is where sidewalks and a vehicle drop off um, all arrive at a, at a kind of public feeling plaza. Um, you'll notice on the slough edge, there are decks and uh, kind of areas uh, that will welcome people as they arrive to walk right out to that edge. And then uh, this is a view from, from the sports complex doing a pretty good job of showing how between the sports complex and this new parking garage, there'll be a very active edge there. Uh, and it's a long continuous uh, connector closing that gap in the system. And then this is at eye level along um, uh, along the parking garage on the right and the sports complex on the left. So um, people would be able to come here, park, unload, uh, and um, go to the sports complex or continue on um, the trail. There will be some amenities in the base of the garage activating this space. And um, the sports complex is very popular and used day and night. So this will be a, a nice addition. And then finally, uh, a view looking back from this observation deck uh, to the sports complex, building two on the left, you can just see uh, there's a generous setback, at least 26 feet of, of trail width there in, in addition to some amenities, and then the, sh the slope of the bank and the slough on the right. Uh, there's been some conversation already about the adaptation um, to sea level rise. The project will be um, uh, uh, adapted to uh, or designed initially to um, meet projections to 2080. And then uh, there are adapt adaptation approaches um, and scenarios to allow us um, to adapt up till 2100. And this is also sort of pegged to the life cycle of the building of, of the buildings. Um, it, it might be helpful to know that towards the top of the drawing, that's lower, and towards the bottom of the drawing, that's higher. The average site elevation right now on the low side is about 13, that'll be raised um, to, to 15. There's a variety of, um, uh, our, our team has developed various options that um, keep the public shoreline uh, accessible uh, through year 2100 with a couple of different adaptation scenarios. I'll show you in, in sections later how those might work. And it's anticipated that, that potential flooding from other offsite properties um, could occur in the future. Uh, there's a bypass, a slough bypass uh, further to the north with a levee only on one side and not the other. And so um, these are beyond the control of the project, but it's anticipated that um, this project would be able to respond to any improvements that are made along that edge um, in the diagrams that were shown. It shows that there's no overtopping there because there is no levee to overtop. So it's, a, it's an anomaly in the, in the mapper's data. Um, these next slides show um, typical sections. I won't talk through them all, um, but these two are important to note, just the general nature-based approach to um, elevating the site and the existing bank. Um, this project does not do uh, any work in the bay. Uh, we have no in-water work, but we will be uh, raising the site and um, uh, planting that uh, edge with, with natives and adaptive species. Um, and then if you see at the top of, in each of those sections, it shows a band uh, that's approximately five feet wide. And that is a zone where in the future, if uh, adaptation scenarios called for something um, even taller than what we've projected, we can accommodate it within that, within that zone. But uh, right now, what you're seeing would, um, 
would be um, a, a, a kind of future proofing the site through 2080. Um, these are other um, sections in the drawing package. I won't speak to them much more than to say, notice the sort of flatness and the ease of transition from the public streets and drop off areas as you go um, towards the towards the slough on the left. Um, very easy to get there, not a lot of visual obstruction. Um, again, a couple of additional sections of the conditions along the trail that I will be happy to come back to if we need to. Um, to summarize this, the drawing on the top shows today's conditions and what we we're proposing to build initially. Uh, the drawing on the bottom shows um, uh, how all of the access and the amenities that are being built uh, will be um, uh, uh, future proofed through uh, 2100. That's the 2100 uh, scenario on the bottom drawing there. Um, but the, the, the decks, the trail, the seating areas, the access to the access will all um, be um, adapted to sea level rise. This is going to be um, a great place to um, to sort of transition out of a vehicle um, and onto a bike or your feet to explore the trail system. Being sort of gracious to all the visitors that we're anticipating, though we're planning on a variety of amenities. This is where you might pump up your tires, fill your water bottle, get some orientation or information, and then set out on on the trail. Uh, the surfacing um, will be on the on the main alignment of the trail is going to be cast concrete. Uh, in other sort of um, special areas or uh, off to the sides, there uh, will be um, cast con or concrete pavers or, um, or decking. Uh, and then along the slew edge of the trail, um, the, the idea is that that has a variety of different um, areas to sort of stop and pause. Um, they're all sort of different for different shaped uh, sort of bodies and, and sizes and ages and, um, and just experience the experiences to kind of observe, um, observe the slew and all that's going on in the panorama to the west. Uh, and then uh, the nature-based adaptation approach of uh, raising that bank and replanting it with natives and adaptives. Um, is um, we refer to it as a kind of native garden. In addition to that, there will be um, some interpretation uh, opportunities about the about the flora and fauna that you might might see. Uh, and there is a, a preliminary um, plant palette of adaptive and native species. This is not this is for the whole project, but uh, I would maybe point out that uh, we're fully anticipating that aquatic species might need to uh, migrate up the bank in the slopes and species that we're choosing are, are all well suited for um, Bay Edge conditions. Um, and I will now uh, pass it back to Ethan to just talk about the public outreach. Thanks. Um, so just one note on the amenities that I wanted to add is that, you know, we are proposing at the ground floor of that parking structure, 15,000 square feet of amenity space that would be open to the public. You know, where we envision it now as a food and beverage like amenity. Um, in talks with the city and talks with sports complex users, it's what they're most excited about. You know, like Marcel mentioned, there's a lot of use at that sports complex. If you go there any given weekday evening, you know, there's hundreds of people um, on multiple different fields. And so um, the idea being that that would be a real asset to them, you know, little league teams, families after work, you know, after a game, et cetera, you know, a place to sort of sit down and celebrate or, you know, get back together, talk about the game, et cetera. Um, we're also providing, we're also proposing a small cafe space closest to the residential use in building three, which we also think would be an excellent amenity also open to the public. There really is no businesses except for the hotel and the um, Audubon Mercedes dealership on the island. And so uh, we think this would be a really great asset for the residents. And I'll talk more, you know, that's a good segue for me to talk about community outreach. Um, and so to date we've hosted an informational session with the Belmont, Belmont Sports Complex users, and that really kicked off our community outreach. Um, this week, we'll be sending a mailer out to all residential addresses on the island, uh, advertising an open house that we'll be hosting at the sports complex on June 7th. Um, following that meeting, we'll also be reaching out to two communities on the other side of 101 from our project, uh, Sterling Downs and Homeview, and we will seek to present at their regular 
HOA meetings, but if we need to, we will also schedule meetings specifically to present our project. Um, and lastly, uh, we'll also complete outreach to residents in Redwood Shores, although a different jurisdiction, obviously extremely um, close to this project, um, and we'll either reach out uh, to their HOA or a separate community organization that has expressed interest in local development projects. Um, in all cases, we'll be providing an email address and other contact information, likely my personal email uh, and, and phone number, so individuals can convey their comments or concerns to the project team, um, and we will conduct additional meetings where follow-up is required based on the feedback that we receive. Um, so with that, I'll wrap it up. Um, thank you so much for your time and consideration tonight. Um, and the whole team is available to answer any questions you might have. Okay, thank you very much, um, Ethan and Marcel. That was very clear. Uh, I'm sure we have a few clarifying questions. Uh, who would like to go first? Uh, Bob, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Samantha. So uh, let's see. I was looking at the project summary in the exhibits and I think I calculated, did I calculate 800 square feet of, of space, building space? And whereas on the permit drawing, it was something closer to 200,000, I think. Yeah, we are proposing 860,000 square feet. Um, I think the original permit for these sites was closer to 235,000. Yeah. Um, very different look and feel and quality of development, obviously. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I had that. I mean, it's it's a, a kind of an upgrade, I guess you would say. Um, and then I'm not super familiar with what is involved in um, biomedical facilities or whatever the term is, but th does that mean that you handle or the, whoever uh, the tenants would handle um, contagious things like uh, COVID and, and the like? And, and is there a risk of... Uh, of that can you kind of uh, release or anything yeah so the types of tenants that we work with handle a wide range of different activities you know that fits under sort of the very broad umbrella of life sciences and so you know we have tenants like lucid motors right who are doing battery research all mm -hmm. the way to abv and amgen working on you know curing diseases um Generally, we're, our tenants are regulated by something called biosafety levels, of which there are four. Um, biosafety level one being the sort of uh, least risk to human health and safety, and bio le biosafety level four being things like Ebola, right, but that are really only dealt with in government labs, right, that we wouldn't see ever in our building. Uh, right now, there are discussions going on at the county level about, um, and at the local jurisdiction level on the peninsula, about which biosafety levels to allow. Um, and so we're closely tracking that, and obviously we'll comply with the regulations that get put in place here. Typically, you know, we see the majority of our tenants within the biosafety level one and two ranges. Um, and I'll just add to that, they are also a highly regulated industry, and so there are a number of federal and state agencies that do, um, you know, ensure that these are items are being dealt with with the utmost care and caution. Yeah, thank you for that answer, and I uh, appreciate the education. It's not something I'm that familiar with. But I am familiar with, uh, well, somewhat familiar with the um, building code based on the level of life safety risk. And I was wondering what level um, this building, being a biomedical, potentially biomedical activities location, is. Is there a significant risk to life safety that would raise the risk level to a three or a four, the critical facility in the engineering architectural jargon yeah this is not my area of expertise but i'll typically say i will say typically no um you know the one area that we are you know sort of you'll see specifically how the building code will interact with us is for you know lab space and chemical storage mm -hmm. um, and so that is you know dealt with in the california building code and again it, it really is about you know life safety so it's about like how yeah. many chemicals can be stored at what elevation you know just thinking about risk to hazard and getting out of the building and so we comply you know we we comply with all of those rules yeah the reason why i'm asking is because um we haven't i didn't see a geotechnical report but the area is you know in in the bay and the soils are typically weak uh bay muds and fill and so if there's a seismic event 
um, you know, that could cause uh, a structural load that um, more critical facilities that are associated with life safety or high density would require um, a more um, conservative or strong or, or uh, more capable of being able to handle an event like that and not collapse, let's say. And likewise, there's uh, it brings in the risk of a tsunami uh, like flood, uh, which uh, would penetrate the site uh, if there was one. So that's why I'm wondering what what level of facility it would be from an engineering uh, building code standpoint. And it's okay if you don't have the answer to that because I I think it's a, it's probably a special case that I'm not familiar with. But that's why I'm asking, and I think it, it it's important. I think we're all a little sensitive to the to the virus uh, issue. And also these are big buildings that may have enough people that raise the risk level, I'm not sure. So. We are a seismic importance level of two, so which is okay. your, your typical commercial building. Um, when we have an assembly space, we would be increased to three, okay. um, but we would very rarely, in no cases that I've seen, are we have we ever gotten to a level four. Um, Unless you know we do have a case where the city has asked us to build for them an emergency operations center, in which case that elevated our building to a four. But okay. we typically, we're at two. And I will also just note that like this is a very proven asset class. San Francisco is the behind the bay, behind the um, Boston Cambridge area, the largest life science cluster in the world, I think, and so and certainly in the country. And so um, there are a lot of cases of these buildings safely operating for many years here. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Thank you for educating me on that. I, I sorry to take so much time. I'm not sure I'm totally comfortable with us being in the lead in, in terms of all that, but I think it's great that that uh, I have a better understanding now. Thank you. Okay, I have a clarifying question. Go ahead. Um, thank you for the presentation and the extra background too on the bike lanes. I think that was helpful. And I was wondering, can you kind of just describe the vehicular circulation on site and like where is the parking and loading access for the buildings and then um, how does the drop off work with parking like could you drop off and then go drive to the parking the garage or just helping us understand where where cars are and where pedestrians are yeah please that'd be great I'll wait for the drop Actually, page eight is probably a good place to be. Yeah, so Island Park is one way in and one way out, um, which is planned south there. And so you cross the bridge over uh, on Island Parkway, you cross the bridge, um, headed plan north. Um, building one and building two are both served by parking, by the main parking structure on your left there. Um, and so the majority of of users accessing either of those buildings would take either the first or second left into the site um, to access that parking structure. That's also how you access the loading area for building one, which is between the parking structure and building one. Um, users of the sports complex would use that same first entrance um, to the parking structure as um, users of building one or two who are accessing through there. Users of building three would make the first right off of Island Parkway before getting to concourse onto the site and go left on into building three's podium parking structure. Um, loading is located in that same area, so loading occurring at building three would also happen um, by taking a right off of Island Parkway um, before getting to concourse. Building two is really the only site that requires people to you know, really penetrate the, the residential area at all. And so you'd come up to the intersection of Concourse Place, make a left. Um, if you were a truck loading, you would make that first right onto Clipper and then a left into Building 2 and to Building 2's loading area. And like I mentioned before, what we really wanted to avoid was a truck, was, a, was turning radiuses that required a truck to make a right on Concourse and a left and circle around Clipper to access the, the rear of Building 2. For folks getting dropped off, you would um, each building has a drop off, a designated drop off area. So for building three, you would pull up past that first right for parking, and the drop off area is located on Island Parkway on that uh, 
plan west face of the building. Um, to be dropped off at building two, um, you would go up to concourse, make a left, and enter into that roundabout and drop off there. And we've made sure that the you know that, that roundabout is generously sized so the confluence of user different types of users can, if need be, stack two or three cars. Um, and so folks using building two and, and likely building one also would get dropped off there. Additionally, there is a drop off area for building one if you were to go back around that roundabout, head back on Island Parkway and pull off to the right immediately after making the right turn on Island Parkway. So there's no cars going from the roundabout to the parking structure along the sort of slew front? Along the slew front? Um, no, you cannot one. access, okay. um, like the roundabout and the pathway that circles the parking structure um, are can't be accessed. Okay. The, and then the, it is a, so for building one loading, so we do show the entire parking structure is circled by, you know, uh, vehicle access. However, the vehicle access on the planned west side of the parking structure is only EVA and very occasional um, loading traffic for trucks that, you know, are bulk gas delivery for building one, which is very occasional and would need to make that loop. But otherwise that area adjacent to the parking structure and, and, and the sports complex is really imagined as a multi-purpose street. And so it will be designed with the materiality and signals to everyone that this is a shared space. Okay, thank you for that. And then for buildings one and two, there do they have lobbies directly? I imagine on that roundabout, the drop off. Um, building two does. Um, the building one lobby is um, right now. I mean, these are preliminary designs, but right now the yeah. building one lobby is imagined as the uh, uh, in the center of the building along Concourse Place. Okay, and can you just kind of describe like the ground floor? active uses on buildings one and two? For building one and two, so typically our buildings are um, so our ground floor, our, our ground up buildings, buildings that we build from scratch, so to speak, um, are 18 feet um, floor to ceiling on the first floor and then 16 feet of, above that for every other floor. And that's one of the unique aspects of a life science building. Um, on the ground floor, the, the uses are taken up largely by the lobby and by the loading area and potentially by utility areas like um, interior trans transformer rooms, um, leaving limited tenant space or other space on the ground floor, but there is some tenant space on the ground floor. For building two and building one, we currently don't have planned any amenity space or you know, we typically don't put retail space per se on the ground floor of our buildings. Um, on building three, we do have that retail space that okay. I mentioned. So like building one has this plaza out front, is that sort of a plaza in front of a blank wall or what's the sort of nature of that? It would all be glazing. Okay. It would still all be glazing. And okay. I think if you want to go back to some of the renderings, you can see that that's all glazing, okay. proposed glazing. Um, and then uh, it was mentioned that the, the whole master plan for this area had a certain amount of public space square footage that was required. Do you know how much public square footage space you're required to provide and how much this is um, proposing? I believe the number that was mentioned was 40 something thousand. Um, in here, um, we're, we're proposing, I think 1.89 acres is what my team was whispering to me, which is obviously more than the 40 some odd thousand. Okay, thank you. Just a follow up clarification, sorry to jump yeah. in, but can you break that down? What's the breakdown between green space and paved areas? Yeah. Approximately. I mean, looking at the drawing, what would you, your 50 50? If you include the, if you include the EVA, which is um, paved for non residential use. Okay. But let's not include that because it is EVA. So, yeah. Um, I'd rather just use the number. It would be good to clarify that. Um, also, just wondering, um, is there any kind of TDM required or TMA that you have to participate in with the shuttle that's in the area or anything like that? There is a TDM required. Um, we'll be submitting one with our, you know, for our CEQA documentation. 
um, and that obviously will carry on and you know, gain a little more resolution as the project moves forward and we get tenants, et cetera. Yeah. Um, one of the measures is joining a TMA. I know that one exists out in this area called commute.org. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's uh, on our radar. Okay. And then do you know what the TDM requirement is, the percent reduction required? We don't have the exact number, but we we know that we meet the requirement. <laughs> yeah. So you don't know what the number is, but you know you're below it. Uh, we targeted to be below it, so I know that like, but I don't know exactly what the number is. <laughs> is it better than fifteen? <laughs> Good afternoon, evening. I'm Cecily Barclay, and I wanted to clarify, we have hired a company called Hexagon to do all of our transportation. They've prepared a local transportation analysis, a vehicle miles traveled analysis, and a separate TDM program that looks at 25 uh, ways, that points that we could earn to get, that are viable for this project. We need to have at least 18 to meet the city's requirements. I don't remember right now if it's like 20, 25%, but there is a number and we have uh, plenty of opportunities to meet that number. And one of them is to participate in the shuttle as you've been mentioned. So we've submitted that to the city in our most recent submittal on April 19th and Hexagon works a lot with the city and their traffic engineers. So we'll, as Ethan said, as this develops, we'll have a little more detail and we can get you the specific reduction number. Okay, but that's helpful, the 20 to 25. Yes, yes. thank you. Okay, appreciate that. Last question. Um, uh, I'm just looking at the BCDC's Adapting Your Rising Tide maps, and it, it looks like this whole area is probably experiencing some flooding today. Do you know if there's any flooding happening in the neighborhood that you're aware of? Um, if by the neighborhood you mean the island? Yeah. Um, there's certainly flooding risks, and um, to the north, they've just finished um, widening culverts and raising the, um, they built a, a seawall on top of a dike um, to the Redwood Shores edge, and so it wouldn't, because that's uh, below sea level almost. Um, on the southern edge of that bypass, um, there's an existing levee, so there's an asymmetrical condition there. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, there could be um, uh, in today, I think in today's um, num uh, in today's scenarios, um, and it's anticipated that one day that other side of this bypass is going to have to be um, uh, improved. We don't know what that is now, but the idea would be, um, this project has left a little bit of room to respond to whatever that project decides to do when it materializes. So there's no sort of adaptation strategy for this area at a higher level yet? That would probably, I believe that's a flood control district type question. Okay. Um, and um, and it happens just off of this, this drawing. You can kind of see it on some of the other diagrams. But, um, it's, but that's, that's what we were able to ask. Okay. Well, I think also one shoreline is active over here, and so one shoreline is looking at this whole region for things that can be done. And just anecdotally, in the last, you know, all of the rain events that we had this last year, I know that our site did not encounter any flooding, um, for what it's worth. Yeah. Well, it's just, it's all connected, right? So if you guys raise everything but nobody else does, it doesn't help you. <laughs> so just wondering if you're kind of aware of a larger strategy for this area or not, or if there isn't one. I don't know that there, I, I think that there, I mean, I, I don't, I will say I don't know affirmatively, but I think that there are a lot of people looking at it, right? Because I know one shoreline, I heard them on NPR, I think just this morning, um, 
but are looking at this whole region and things that can be done. And I think that I, was, I think the levy, the, the, the wall that's along this, the, I don't know the right name of the body of water, but the waterway to the plan north of the site can be adapted to uh, increase. Whether or not Belmont right now has the budget set aside to do it, that I don't know. And I don't believe so. Go ahead. I wanted to mention a couple of things, just if you saw the, if we go back, don't need to go back to the flooding, but when you do Island Park itself uh, is out and the sports complex and much of the parking structure, and I can't remember how much of 501, but as you come up onto the island, it's actually pretty high mm -hmm. and you don't ever have a problem until you get up closer to where the shoreline band is and then we'll raise that. And um, up just right outside this picture, Foster City is putting in a levy system as you heard just now. So when you listen a little bit to the city talk, there does need to be a levy of some sort or a raising of the edge of the island around. And there is a connection between the reservoir in the middle and there's a um, underground culvert that goes out. And there are ways to manage that culvert with gates to protect the island. So while this doesn't, because our whole site will be high enough, this happens to be where the site is and then these improvements along the edge will be high, that's good. But I think there will be lots of attention being paid uh, to kind of get the whole park. And then as everybody's noting, that blue went a lot, you know, further than just the island. Um, it goes quite broadly. And as Ethan mentioned, one shoreline and, and other agencies are necessarily paying a lot of attention to this as are you and your entire commission. Thanks. No more questions. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Uh, Gary? Yes. Um, is there any accommodation for like a emergency access plan in the event of flooding since it seems like that could have happened in 2050 um, with some regularity. So um, assuming that would happen, is there a way to evacuate or do you, are you required to deal with that or have you taken any initiative to deal with that? We, have, we are not, as far as I know, required to deal with that. Um, I think the one thing that we are doing um, is raising the not only the the shoreline area that we've shown today, but also the um, the floor level of all of the buildings. And so the slab is also being raised to the I want to say it's a 2080 100 year flood level. Um, so we do think that um, you know, residents in the building would or we, we don't anticipate. We, we hope that we are anticipating a condition that you know we can hopefully get ahead of. At least for a while yeah. um, within the buildings, and obviously for our participants, for our tenants in the buildings. Yeah, tenants will be safe on site. Um, and then there was a mention about the life cycle of the project as tied to the projected sea level rise. Can you explain what is the projected lifespan of the building? I'm not sure that we have like a specific. Um, I think. I don't think we have a specific lifespan of the building. I do know that was was said earlier. I also noticed that was said earlier, but I don't think we have a very specific lifespan of the building. I think it was being meant more broadly, sort of a, the lifespan of a commercial office building in this in this world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just curious, what is that in in the in your eyes? Uh, you know, in your in terms of your um, future planning, what do you? How far ahead do you look before you assume that this building has lived out its you know, useful life and would probably need to be reconsidered. Yeah, I mean, it's extremely hard to tell, um, but obviously, like I said, we're, we're, we're adapting to a 2080, which is 60 years from now. Um, you know, because we're dealing with life science and obviously our tenants are working sort of at the, at the cutting edge of technology, um, it's likely that intermittently we would have to make upgrades mm -hmm. to accommodate their use to make sure that we're, um, you know, remaining sort of a relevant piece mm -hmm. of real estate for them. Um, yeah, it's not a perfect question, but it's uh, not a perfect answer, rather. But no, it, it's not a true question. I'm just trying to educate myself on that. Thank you. Other question? Yeah. Um, could you maybe briefly just describe the extent of the improvements along concourse 
and Island Parkway that are essentially off-site. You mentioned at one point a Class 4 bike lane, and I'm trying to read the drawings. I believe that's on the south side of Concourse. Is that correct? Yeah, so we're proposing... Um, so, our, our, so typically the streets will work the same way, um, but we are proposing... I'll just start from the bottom of the plan. Um, so when you come on to Island Parkway, um, we are proposing a hawk signal um, in order for existing um, existing bike lanes, existing bike paths um, adjacent to the, you can see sort of a grayed out sport field at the very bottom of the plan there. Um, there's a bike lane that circles that and cuts across for people who want to access Redwood Shores and go between. Um, we're proposing a hawk signal for that crossing. Um, we're proposing protected class two bike lanes, um, more or less from the edge of the plan on the bottom of the plan there all the way up to Concourse Place. Um, at Concourse Place, like you mentioned, we are pr proposing a class four um, bike lane. So essentially a you know, protected two-way cycle track uh, plan north. So you would cross the street. Sorry, you're right, plan, plan south. So on that side of the street, that would connect essentially um, folks with access to Bay Trail from that Oracle Bridge um, and want a shortcut across um, to you know, our main plaza area. And then um, uh, for the loop that goes on Clipper Drive, so if you go you know, to the right of the plan through the residential area and back around to our building two, um, we're proposing um, class two, typical class two bike lanes. And then essentially if you're on the, I guess it's an extension of the Bay Trail or the Slew Trail, you can pass under Island Parkway if you're traveling from east to west. Correct, if you were to and cross the Oracle Bridge and hook a left, you would go under uh, under Island Parkway, right? And, and, access to and can you just sort of describe to me sort of if you were coming from that direction or from the Oracle direction on a bicycle, trying to reach Building 1 or Building 2, you would access them along the western side, basically would come on to the new promenade? Sure. If you So if you were coming, let's say, from the Oracle campus and you crossed over that bridge, to get to building one or building two, you can make a right and then jump on to that class four cycle path, that, the cycle track that we were just discussing, or you could make a left um, and take the path that exists, um, go under Island Parkway, you would end up at the sports complex surface parking area. Um, at that point, right after you pass their parking lot and you see a small building, that's they call that the sports complex conference center, um, you could make a right there um, and there is a path that um, travels on the Belmont Sports Complex site, um, more or less following the line of our property line um, to connect with with our proposed path, more or less where, you know, adjacent to Building 1 or right where you see that blue shoreline band pickup. Um, that would be a mixed-use mixed use path. Or you could circle around uh, the, the complex uh, and pick it up in exactly the same spot. And I believe the city has recently made improvements to that trail. Okay, thank you for those clarifications. Okay, and just uh, a couple more questions for me, sorry, to wrap up. Uh, could we go back, Ashley, could you just go back to the rendering for building two, the ground level rendering? I just want to make sure I understand what you described. That first slide, do you think? Uh, I think the... Well, that, 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 we could probably discuss it here. So you can see uh, this one was, well, this is building um, one. That's the parking yeah. garage. Yeah, and the parking, sorry, parking garage. But it, this would be okay. Just pause here for a minute. So inside there, that's the space you referred to that would be a, some type of restaurant facility or cafe or something like that. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. And just a question. Do you, I'm not familiar with your company. Do you hold the assets when you develop these projects or do you um, sell them on? We are typically long-term uh, owners. Mm -hmm. So we're developers, long-term owners, operators. It's part of a sort of mm -hmm. a key component of our brand. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So would you manage the tenancies for like a ground floor, floor cafe or something like that? Yeah, so for, for ground floor space in this market, typically because we – um, we know that these are amenities that our tenants require and, mm -hmm. and that we market to our tenants as mm -hmm. going to be at the site. Mm -hmm. um, we don't take a risk with, uh, you know, making these a for lease retail space. Rather, mm -hmm. we enter into a contract with a, um, you know, an amenity food and beverage operator 
And so we can guarantee that, you know, the services that we're telling them will be there are there mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. And could you comment on just, uh, have you thought about how the project would be phased? Where would you start phase one? Yeah, right now, I mean, obviously everything is, is somewhat subject to market forces, but right now we imagine that phase one would include building, what we're calling building one um, and the parking structure. Mm -hmm. Phase two would probably include building two because it's also served by the same parking structure that we would have already built. And then phase three would be building three and standalone. And typically, um, you know, things like these, um, we are proposing to build these these public amenities, including the open space amenities, as part of phase one. Right. Thank you. And just I, I just want to check: is there a ground level rendering similar to that for building two in the package? I there is on the um, more focused on the trail experience, but you can right. see building two to the left. Could um, we just maybe go to that not rendering? Right slide. No, the other way. There's like a high level, high quality rendering that's next right. to building too. Well, Not that these are. Tell me what slide. Just yeah. towards the end, like pa right past the parking structure slide, I think. Right there. Building two's on the left there. Right. So on the left there, and I know it's early days in design, but on the left, we see. Can you describe what that is we're seeing in, at ground level and that it looks like mezzanine or something? Could you? Yeah. Yeah, so um, here we're, I mean, this is really sort of a renderer's interpretation of something that a tenant could be doing in there. Um, we are corn shell developers, and so we don't program, um, you know, all of the space except that core building space, so lobbies, you know, elevator areas, um, mechanical areas, things like this. Um, so we would, we would have to, that would, that would be at the, um, the, the tenant would get to choose what goes there exactly. Right. Okay, so the umbrellas and the outdoor tables and chairs are sort of a representation of what a tenant might. For the, sorry, I, mis tenant. I misinterpreted that. I thought, so interior would be at the tenant's discretion. On the exterior, right. um, and we haven't gotten to the level of um, programming yet of exterior FF&E or things like this, but you know, we could and typically do at the ground floor program things like furniture. Okay. But there isn't a cafe. No, the cafe would be farther up at the right when you hit the corner of the parking structure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, that concludes clarifying questions from the board. Um, we'll move to public comment on the presentation. Um, presentation so uh, we'll open up the meeting to public comment any members of the public attending the meeting in person please notify the board secretary if you would like to make a comment any comments at this stage okay and if you're attending online and would like to make a public comment please raise your virtual hand to speak we do have one public comment okay thank you Uh, Gita Dev, I'm going to unmute you, and you will have three minutes to speak. Good evening, board members. My name is Gita Dev. Um, I'm with the Sierra Club, and I did send in a short letter uh, on Friday, which I hope you had a chance to take a look at. Uh, I, I want to uh, thank everyone for a wonderful presentation. And as, and as an architect myself, I can appreciate a lot of the work that's gone into it. I do have a few comments um, that I hope that the board will consider. And I hope that the, uh, that the owner will consider too. One of them is that this is very close to the Redwood Shores Ecological Reserve, which is all along Redwood Shores and all along Belmont Slough. It's a federal reserve. It's a very rich bird watching area. It has a lot of species. You should see the website. It's really fun. Um, so bird safe design is a really important issue. And in looking at the facades, they are extremely glassy above the parking. And uh, it is very important that we do bird safe design and that we maintain the lighting so that I know that biotech labs often stay up all night, they stay lit all night. However, where they are facing onto the slough, 
it's really important that we have automatic shades that come down. So we do get nocturnal creatures that can feed at night. Um, and also for exterior lighting to be sensitive to the bird safe design standards. I'd be happy to provide you more information on that. Um, I do want to uh, thank someone for raising the issue of biosafety. Life sciences labs are biohazardous, and these are not issues that our codes have caught up with. As an architect, I'm very familiar with the codes. And even with the um, state fire marshal's office, they are very familiar for 100 years of chemical hazards and radiological hazards, but biohazards are so new that they have not caught up with them. They don't maintain a database. So the four biosafety levels, as uh, the client pointed out, biosafety level three and four deal with very infectious agents. And most of the labs do not deal with biosafety level three, but we would like to make sure that in such a hazardous area, we don't get involved in such a serious biohazard that cannot be contained in the event of um, you know, serious seismic events, flooding events, interruption of power, uh, for long have period. One minute time. left. I just want to let you know. Thank you. you have, okay. One minute left. Very good. Um, this, the last point I'd like to make is that while truly understanding the issue of uh, large plate design for for tenants, I do feel it's really important from one shoreline's policy point of view and from a safety point of view to maintain the 100 feet of setback. Um, and to provide a much gentler slope on the uh, water side. The uh, one shoreline re recommends a 100 feet setback from the water's edge and to keep the trail at the land side of that 100 foot so as to allow a very gentle slope uh, to allow migration of species upland on a gentler slope than two to one. An ecotone slope is 20 to one but uh, something more than two to one would be a much, much desirable. I think there may be a way to wrap it up. Thank you. I appreciate your uh, efforts in, um, in the, from the board to manage the design process. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that comment. We appreciate it. Uh, they're important issues. Okay, uh, is that the end of public comment? There are no more public comments. Okay, thank you. Good. Okay, we'll move to the next item on the agenda, which is board discussion and advice. And so this is the stage where of the meeting where the board discusses this amongst ourselves. We have been given four questions by the staff to consider in our discussion. And the first one is just to make sure that we have maximum sense of feeling of publicness um, along the shoreline. So we could comment on that. And commenting the second area, just uh, to comment on anything that we could see that might improve public access along the shore. Uh, the third one is uh, to make sure, you know, to our thoughts on the public areas and resiliency and adaptation. Uh, given what lies ahead, the sea level rise. And then the fourth area was uh, really focused more on connections and adequacy and legibility of quick connections for bikes and pedestrians from the adjacent bike pedestrian networks and from the adjacent roadways. So we're all very familiar with those um, areas. And so we can build the dialogue around these four questions and other things that we think are important. So with that, um, I don't think we'll, well, we, we could start by going down the questions if you like, the four questions, um, or we could just go by person and have uh, people comment on what they think is important in relation to the questions. I think we might do it that way today for this project. So uh, who would like to lead off? Bob? Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for the presentation and, and, and the answers to our questions. Really appreciate that. Um, 
So I will make, have a list of thoughts for our board discussion that cover several of the questions. Um, my first comment is uh, a slope of two to one, which I think is the slope uh, for the living shoreline is not something that you would consider a geomorphically natural slope on a, a wetland edge uh, in the intertidal. So I, I think that, you know, as sea level rises, the higher marsh plants could migrate up, but I think uh, the lower part of the slope would be a steep, unvegetated slope, you know, once they got to the depth that cordgrass couldn't grow. I, I see you have WRA, so I think they're going to get on that and, and, and work with you on that. Um, but I think the bottom line is a flatter slope would be better. And if it's not a flatter slope, I'm not really sure it's a living shoreline, even though there may, it may have some benefit at the upper part of the slope in terms of, you know, some upland habitat. Um, my next qu uh, comment is, uh, yeah, the exhibits on page seven and eight show the building two encroaching into the shoreline band. And that combined with the, the massive square footage makes me wonder if that uh, building couldn't be moved back out of the shoreline band to provide room again for flattening the slope on that living shoreline and providing kind of more space uh, for adaptation, but also just for people within the shoreline band. Uh, my next question, uh, comment is, this is kind of a funny one, exhibit 27, B, that bird blind looks really interesting, but I just, I guess that's just a generic bird blind. It, it didn't look like the ones I normally see around here. I don't know. Just look like you could see people through it, which, so I just, I'm not an expert on bird blinds. Um, it looked, it looked cool though. Uh, let's see the, uh, exhibit 26. A, it shows a boardwalk with people sitting on the edge over the water, which is something that I think, you know, people like to sit on the edge of a boardwalk around the bay, <clears throat> I've heard. That was an engineering joke. I don't know if you remember the song, Sitting at the Dog. Okay, sorry. But uh, <laughs> no one laughed. I have to explain it. So, uh, but... Um, I don't know. It just seems like you might want to have railings or ha maybe have that floating or have some sort of down ramp uh, you know, or something just because you don't really want people to stumble off of that at night. So I, I guess that's an artistic kind of thing that isn't necessarily what you're going to do. Um, let's see. Um, talked about the two to one slope. Uh, yeah, I think the question about um, other than bay water level flood sources, whether it be direct precipitation, runoff, groundwater, I don't think groundwater is going to be an issue with your high uh, grades, but I think all those factors will probably be considered later in the design, and I would assume that the applicant would be responsible to upgrade their uh, elevation criteria to conform to any additional um, higher water levels. Uh, exhibit 28 marsh plants didn't seem to be, yeah, I'm not a botanist, but they just didn't seem to be quite the native plants to me, so I assume that's going to change. Um, exhibit 29 uh, I didn't see any environmental groups mentioned, and the Sierra Club provided some comments, so I suggest it might be worth reaching out to some uh, broader than just the residents and, and neighbors in the city. Um, and then, uh, you know, again, this hasn't been under engineering review. If this is new fill, uh, it would go to the engineering criteria review board, but I don't think it is. And so, um, there is a question as to whether or not the fill elevations are post settlement because you're adding a lot of fill. And then of, of course, around here, the, um, certainly the 
bay mud below the fill consolidates with the extra overburden and you get some settlement that can be substantial. Um, you know, it could be 20, 30% of the fill thickness. I don't know. I mean, it's possible. So um, I think that's something that I, I would suggest that staff have you just check as you move on into your work. So those are all my comments. I guess the main one is I like the idea of the living, living shoreline. I, I do think you could move the shore back and flatten that slope, but it might require you to um, reduce your building footprint on building two, I think it is, and maybe some other ones. So, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Bob. And look, we'll, as we continue through, I'm, we'll probably come back to some of those points you've raised, which are um, very helpful. Yeah. Um, Stefan, do you want to comment on some of the questions or other things? Sure, I think, um, and I welcome others to sort of build on this. I think, um, you know, I, I, I want to say that I, I like the opportunity of creating a more open, welcoming public access along the slough. And that's, you know, it's the western side of the project. It's got good solar access. It's sort of makes a lot of sense to me. I'm trying to figure out why you wouldn't make a stronger public connection to the Bay Trail with the understanding that the majority of the public access is at the southern portion of where the confluence. And um, there's this really strong statement that's being made in front of this project, and then it sort of stops um, at the southern edge, even though the the way it, we're understanding it is that the city parking lot is being repaved. Right. So it seems like there's a really strong opportunity there. It seems crazy to invest in a 12 level parking garage and not figure out how to share that amenity with a um, um, a, a, a series of sports fields. I still don't really understand why there's why we still need a surface lot. And it's I don't know. Maybe there's a, enough demand on weekends, but I can imagine that the majority of the demand is like the there's got to be sort of a perfect demand relationship between when the sports facility needs parking and when people are actually working in this facility. So um, I don't know. It just even if you could actually make the parking lot a little smaller and create a more significant public space where the Bay Trail comes into this new promenade that's being created, um, it seems like there's a real opportunity there. And that's like the fourth point, I think, that um, the staff mentioned in, in, the, um, um, in the letter. Um, and then I, I think I, I want to say I like the attention to the sort of public frontage and the experience again sort of along this promenade. Um, the um, the like animation of that space just via sort of active ground floor use seems unlikely. And so I'm wondering if there's like sort of another more layered approach. I could sort of imagine a little bit of retail or restaurant activity, but it also seems like more attention to the ground plane, whether it's, you know, edges of the building that can sort of become seating areas or, um, you know, some articulation of the depth of the building with the ground plane mm -hmm. that can, um, or areas of landscaping on the building side, just things that can sort of make that more an interesting um, two-sided experience for a pedestrian. Um, I think I would maybe appreciate some attention to that. Um, and then um, I, I, I always have a concern with these um, life science buildings that actually are really tall or they're, they are um, shouldn't say really tall. Compared to what's around, they're much significantly taller. Um, and so 
I would always sort of want to sort of understand um, what's happening with shadow and public space. I think we have good, again, good southern and western exposure on here, but I'm curious about what happens with the wind um, and if there are um, issues with orientation to the bay and sort of significant downdrafts that would be occurring um, on the public spaces that are occurring. Um, that sometimes that's sort of an, I think, important thing to think about when we're thinking about the quality of the public experience in these spaces. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jacqueline. Some really good points raised there. I think if we'll keep going along, everyone can get their key points on the table and then we can sort of just uh, build on that. So, yeah, go ahead, Kristen. Um, yeah, good point. And I think uh, I think it's important to put these plans into the kind of bigger picture planning context. And it seems like we don't necessarily know exactly what the bigger picture is in terms of the adaptation strategies for the SLUs. I think that's helpful to kind of get that understanding of kind of conceptually what's happening. So lacking that, you know, if we look at the master plan, the whole island has like a hundred foot setback and this would be the first place on the island to break it. That sort of gives an opportunity to create those levees and have more room for adaptation. And we've seen this, you know, on a number of projects where um, I completely understand the R&D buildings have a very inflexible <laughs> floor plate and dimensions and all of that. Um, and then you combine that with the 100 foot setback and it makes, and then the setbacks on the street and the, grade to be able to get up to the higher level and all of that. And I understand it, it becomes constrained, particularly for that building one, building two. It's just, it's really kind of jammed in there. Um, and I wonder if, um, I, it just seems like that's a, a big pinch point. And um, I wonder if there's opportunities to minimize that pinch point as much as possible. Um, so that there could be more room for more adaptation areas and maybe you just have one place where it's sort of pinched but there's a lot more other space where you can be more generous with this kind of ecotone levy idea and i don't know if, B if bcbc has guidance on exactly what an ecotone levy needs to look like or what slope dimensions should be one-to-one -one or whatever two-to-one whatever it is um, but i think that would be helpful um, and it just, um, it, it, everything's getting so jammed that like public access is now kind of encroaching into this marsh, marsh area and the slope is really steep. And, um, it, you know, when we talk about habitat areas, we're generally wanting to create more of a buffer between the kind of the public access and the wetland. And those are things that require space. Um, so I don't know if there's something to do there around pushing the building closer to the road or minimizing the drop-off area or something that could give you more space to kind of minimize that pinch point. Um, I'll, I'll also just say the I agree with Stefan's comments about the access to the Bay Trail at the southern end being sort of lost in this parking lot and then an entrance into the parking structure. And besides the sort of bay trail, there's not a clear, there's not a very big clear kind of public access entry into this trail system. Um, so I think that could be improved. And I also, um, I, I don't know, I don't think you can consider this EVA area that has loading access on it part of a trail specifically if there are vehicles coming through there. I don't know if that counts as public access in the way the master plan conceptualizes it. Um, I'll also just say cycle tracks are really good for T intersections where they can be not interrupted, but where cycle tracks are crossed by roads. Um, it creates like a six-way intersection that can be dangerous for the cyclist. So I don't know, maybe move the cycle track to the north side of that street where you can manage those intersections a little more cleanly or just do a bike lane. That's more kind of the typical condition maybe. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is um, 
there's just there's just a lot of parking um a lot of like the arrival to the site is just going to be a lot of parking this huge parking structure and then building three with the however many levels of parking below it and i i i know that those aren't areas aren't in the bcdc jurisdiction and all that but um I would just encourage you to try to reduce parking if you can by using some of those TMA, PDM measures. It looks like you have one space per employee offered right now. If I do my math, about 400 square feet per employee. Um, so I don't know if there's some ways to reduce that, but I think it just, it's a very, to Stefan's point, there's just so much density here. And I love density, but a lot of the density is in the parking mass, um, which just, I think, sort of, um, you know, impacts the public realm experience quite a bit. That's it. Yeah, these are these are all great comments. I'm going to try hard not to be redundant, but I, I agree with so much of what has been said. Um, the West uh, experience, you know, I think there's an opportunity for a really wonderful landscape. And, you know, I think that, you know, that's been demonstrated in this presentation. There are a lot of amenities and that are um, put forward and the connection to the trail system, I think is also, you know, a big benefit. Um, what, what I'm concerned about a little bit is that, you know, when you, when you do get to the West, it is, it is a nice experience. And I'm glad you brought up Stefan, the idea of the South uh, focal point, because, you know, you really have to go deep into the site to get to the turnaround entry plaza, you know, where you really have a point of arrival and the, you know, the entry experience um, coming up Island Parkway. I mean, this is a tremendously wide road, like an arterial serving the site. And I, I kind of have a question about why, why it's so wide. And even in the renders, um, <clears throat> it seems like it could use more mediating elements, something between the scale of the very tall buildings and the rather flat ground plane, you know, more large trees or some kind of architectural gesture to make a more human scale experience on your way to the, the um, shoreline area. Uh, and when you do get to the point of arrival, you know, it's, it's described as a plaza. Um, there's a tremendous amount of paving in order to get to the plaza. And then when you get there, you know, I think there's a question about whether maybe the plaza is better as a, you know, as a magnificently green verdant space, which is the gateway to the, you know, to the, to the waterfront. Um, I like the, you know, the deck as a, as a kind of a terminus and a focal point at the north end of the, um, the open space. I think that's really nice. I think is that maybe Bob, what you were referring to as the, as the bird blind or whatever, which I think is actually a site sculpture, you know, of sorts. And, and um, it's interesting that you were wondering what that was. And I, and I was thinking maybe there's a way of, you know, as that thing comes to life, that it maybe has a wind, um, you know, sheltering function and starts to do a whole bunch of different things, you know, for people to pause there. Um, so I, I like having a focal point there. It just seems like maybe its function could be, I'm sure it will become more justified as, as it goes on. Um, you know, the, there's just a lot of paving throughout in the EVAs, and I think the two-to-one slope has been mentioned, you know, as an indication that the site is tight. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't think that the design review board should make a habit of, of um, you know, endorsing buildings which are inside the shoreline band. I mean, there are so many converging site conditions and sea level rise issues and access issues that I, I agree with Kristen and others that there needs to be more space, you know, to adapt in the future, given that there is no future adapt adaptation plan in place. And I'm sure, you know, something will happen, but, you know, we really don't know what economic conditions and timelines, you know, is, uh, is ahead of us. So, um, you know, it seems very, you know, very hopeful, very optimistic that that will be solved. I think that, you know, to date, the way those problems are being solved on the Bay is with levees. And um, I hate to see more levees around the Bay. We've seen some really big ones in Foster City and Burlingame. And building, you know, building a site like this so, so heavily 
I think it creates more demand for levees. So um, I think given the, given the times that, that it would be great if, this, if the project had a narrative which was all about sea level rise and adaptation. Um, so I think I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, thanks, Gary. And um, I just want to put a few ideas forward, um, really stemming from, I think, you know, one of the early comments in the presentation, and I think staff have made this point as well, is, you know, this site is located in a particularly interesting ecological area with the confluence of these two sewers. And, uh, you know, you, the Sierra Club's uh, public comment and their submission, you know, made some very strong points about this as well, the ecological value, the habitat value for birds, et cetera. And so, and when we looked at the permitting diagram, you know, the green space there, 47,000 square feet, I think in the original permit, the, there was probably, it was envisaged, I'm sure, that it be green space. Um, you know, this is not a bay trail per se, but connects into a network of trails that connects to the bay trail. So it's got some real significance. And when I was down on site the weekend before last um, and walking, there is no question, as the proponent said, that this is well used. And, you know, the matting on the unformed trail was um, <laughs> being tested outside. I was walking along and there are cyclists trying to cycle through there. And uh, and then, you know, the sports park, very well used. And in fact, on the plan, the little white rectangle, uh, the little white, it's almost a square there. That's the, that's the small brick building where the volunteer parents serve the hot dogs, you know, to the kids playing baseball there in the afternoons. And, and, it was just, you know, I was looking at the site plan on site next to the bleachers where I sat and ate my hot dog and contemplated the drawings. And and uh, it just, it's very hard to reconcile um, a much loved recreation area uh, and the environmental um, significance of the adjacent sloughs with the amount of hardscape that's immediately adjacent. And, and you know, if you're, we've got 25 feet uh, I mean, it's within probably eight to ten feet of that little brick building where the mothers and fathers are selling the hot dogs. And, and you know, and so the to the point about, you know, raised in the first question, you know, how public does public space feel? Um, you know, I think there needs to be more done to just green, more green space on the site, softening the interface with the building, softening the interface with the parking structure. I mean, we've all worked on many, many projects over the years where spaces are promised at the ground floor that will be welcoming and uses that, you know, may not materialize in the way that or is originally envisaged. And I do, you know, just on building two, I, you know, I just, uh, I really struggled with the way the entry set down, you know, the, the loop around the, the tree and the green in the middle, you know, I, I think that should be absolutely minimized to the minimum amount needed to come in and drop set down. You know, we see all sorts of configurations in projects that are not necessarily like that. I think the challenge in this project is there is so much building on the site that, you know, the EVA access and truck access really have to circle and circle all of these buildings. So you end up with, you know, basically all circulation doubling as, you know, the, the public uh, walkway. So, you know, I, I struggle with this proposal as it is currently presented, you know, to really feel public, I, you know, I struggle. I, I just think there needs to, if you were, if you were on question two, you know, if you're improving public access experience along the shoreline, I think it's very hard to see how you can do much with the, the current configuration and you know where the 25 foot path, um, you know, is basically adjacent to the building face, even with uh, building two. 
So um, I think we've talked about resiliency and adaptation. And I think the point is really well made, particularly about on the southern entrance. Um, you know, there are really two entry points here. There's the, I guess, the staff, predominantly staff entry to the parking structure, building one. And then there's, you know, the building two drop off. But it just seems that the area to the south, which is the, the city parking lot, is, and, and there are plenty of people parking there on the weekends. And I think some of probably the neighbours, the residential neighbours, even just park their cars in the vacant area. But there's definitely a lot of uh, use of parking. So, you know, the city parking lot, I get it. But putting it, you know, as you're, you made the point, Stefan, you know, right next to a really big parking garage, um, you know, can there be more synergy between the two? And it's, it's, a, it's just sort of strange to see the, the public walkway um, sort of turning back into basically the loading dock for two buildings. So it, it, I find that hard, you know, if you're coming in from the street, would you really intuitively feel that, you know, you, you, you want to go across the um, delivery area to get to the walking trail. It seems a little counterintuitive to me. So, um, so that's sort of where I'm at. I think if what I'm hearing you say is that the tightness of the sort of promenade and the limitation of the, you know, the buildings coming right up to that line that there's sort of a real limited space that is sort of linear, mm. but you've just described two spaces where that could actually broaden out into a larger public space mm. that might be more appropriate for gathering and resting and not be so dependent on mm. ground floor activity. And one would be reconfiguring at least a portion of the, the city's um, parking lot, the surface lot at the south, but the other one would be shrinking the drop off and looking for a larger public space to emerge at that end. Mm -hmm. And then you could be thinking about that promenade more as sort of a connector between two mm -hmm. larger, more significant public spaces. Yeah. Um, and those are both connecting back um, to the primary access points coming into the site. Yeah. Um, not to mention that just the idea of softening the promenade and giving some relief to that space still seems to be desirable. Yeah. yeah. And could I jump in on that? I mean, I, um, I think there is some space around the turnaround, which I think is what you're referring to when you say the plaza. Mm, that's right. And, and uh, to flatten the slope without impacting the building. And I think that would still be in the 100 foot band. But I do think I understand, oh, this, this isn't what I do, but I understand that there's a need to have a turnaround there for vehicular access and the like. So I, I understand why it is the way it is, but it does seem like they're all along that west side of west side of building two down to the turnaround promenade area. There's a uh, space for, I think, flattening the slope and, and providing you know, maybe letting the water in a little bit as sea level rises and maybe doing something interesting mm. um, so that, you know, you can still have the trails up high and maybe you can get down to the water mm. in there or just passively observe the wildlife uh, down there and then provide more space. And, and I think you have more of an ecotone because below the emergent marsh vegetation is typically mud flat. And if you have a two to one slope and the water level is up, you know, mid slope or higher, you just have what? Bare mud, right? And it's not a high energy area, so it might not erode, but I just don't think it's really, you know, for the long term, I don't think it's going to be all that attractive. You know, we review lots of campus projects and it is interesting that you know most to see here on the plan on uh, Island Parkway which is developed and that's 
how it is right now. But the first entry you're going to arrive to is the entry to the parking structure and building one. And there are lots of campuses where that might be the only entry. And building two, you would walk to building two from that first entry point. And so you could imagine another scenario where you actually downplay that northern circular setdown. Uh, you might keep EVA and loading access if you have to, but really play down that so that you, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to think creatively, how do you capture more space that you can convert back? Because we also see lots of those sit downs where nobody ever uses it because the staff all park in the garage and then walk up to the building. So you know, they, there could be some potential to take a close look at that area and see what could be done to modify the well, and I'm still interested in this idea that the building square footage is over 80,000 square feet, whereas the, the permit... 800. 800, I'm sorry, 800,000, yes, 800,000. I should know that as an engineer. Um, 800,000, over 800,000 square feet versus the old permit drawing said something like 230,000 square feet. And I was, well, and then I realized, oh, yeah, the buildings are a lot bigger. Um, <laughs> But it does seem like there should be some room economically to move the buildings out of the shoreline band and create some space. I, I don't, I'm not a developer, but it just, my intuition is that that's something that's not unreasonable for us to ask, ask for, or at least to uh, be considered, um, especially if it provides. Uh, Ecological benefits, adaptation benefits, and public access benefits, you know, all the things that DCDC is interested in yeah. uh, in the shoreline dam. Yeah. I, I mean, I can imagine that um, when that permit was approved, however long ago, that that probably was a feasible project and cost of construction have gone way up and probably all of the geotechnical stuff you talked about, like I don't know how many piles you're going to have to put into this ground, and I'm sure that makes it very expensive land to develop. Just the fact of the vulnerability, sea level rise vulnerability, and having to add surplus weight on, on top, you know, more fill, and all, that's all very expensive. And I'm sure that's one of the things that's driving you to try to seek more square footage to be able to pay for the horizontal stuff that's happening underneath the building. And I know too, like these R and D buildings, they like they're very rigid, right? And and I think there's a lot of factors here that are pushing these buildings, you know, into that shoreline band. <laughs> but it's our job to push back on that, and it's our job to be looking out for future adaptation strategies for these areas and ensuring that there's enough room for those adaptation strategies to happen. Um, and ensuring that it's happening in a way that is um, consistent with kind of larger regional goals and visions um, and the, the ecological well-being of these areas. So I think, under, I, I think it's safe to say that we understand the pressures and also there's, there are these other pressures that we sort of have to look out for on this board. So I think... Um, That's sort of a bigger picture view of it. I also think some of these ideas about, like, do you have to have a big automobile drop-off as the placemaking idea for your campus? I think you're hearing from us that that may not be the best placemaking idea, and that would also allow you to have some opportunities to give more space to the, um, the levy and the resilience strategies within the campus. So, well, look, I think we've... I think we're all in pretty close uh, agreement in terms of the concerns we have. I don't, I think it's fairly clear, uh, so I don't think I need to go back and recap. Um, this is our first review and obviously we're getting to know the project and, and I just want to echo what Kristen said, you know, we completely understand the complexity of developing in the Bay Area, um, and we understand the factors that are driving uh, the amount of square footage that you, you know, you 
you would like to place on the site. Uh, I think we've given you just uh, clear, as clear a feedback as we can on the, the issues that are of interest to us uh, and of interest to BCDC. So uh, I think, you know, we, we can end the board discussion at this point. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the next step is uh, some uh, response from the proponent. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot that looks very good in the project. It sounds like we've, you know, raised a lot of concerns, but there is a lot that looks really good. And I think some of the positives that are clearly there is, you know, introducing some greatly enhanced and much needed uh, connectivity along the slew for pedestrians and cycles. So, you know, I really applaud you on a number of the things you're doing. Um, but we are really concerned about uh, the issues that, the environmental issues that, uh, you know, we're going to be facing in, in every project we were doing now that is new development. You know, when we talk about mid-century, we are in 2023 now. So, you know, this is not something that's really off in the far distance. It's something that, you know, everyone will be, you know, probably everyone at the table now will still be, you know, around in mid-century, you know. So it's, it's these are, you know, very immediate concerns. So that's why we discuss them with such seriousness at the board. Yes. So normally I'm, I'm asking for more accommodation of sea level rise, and, and I should have mentioned that it, uh, I think your plan is consistent with the BCDC guidelines, um, uh, albeit, uh, uh, you know, scrunched up and tight on that side and, and with the kind of Anyway, the other comments we already had, but I, but I think that you know filling the site as much as you ha uh, are planning to, and raising the, the floor elevations for 2080, and um, 100 year event, and uh, having some adaptation uh, plan and capacity, is consistent with uh, the guidelines, especially at the medium high risk diversion level. Um, so, and then as far as you know, one of the comments I was going to make as an engineer was what happens to the drainage that comes off the site as you raise it, you know, the kind of floodplain management stuff we think about, but the site's already higher than the other ones. And um, so I don't know that that applies here. And then also uh, this is uh, something I don't think any of us have quite figured out. And as you point out, one shoreline is looking at how do you put all this together? You know, um, how do you make an integrated plan with a bunch of private parcels and government overlays and stuff? So I think, you know, I, I kind of feel like your civil rise plan is, is pretty reasonable. It must be pretty expensive too. Yeah. Can I just follow that for a second? Um, yeah, does it follow BCDC guidelines? I mean, I, I, I see the adaptation strategies put forward, which is a couple of typical sections of how it would be adapted, yeah. but I, I think that we always should ask for a plan of the adaptation plan, as well as the section, because, you know, I think it's mentioned, you know, water comes in from everywhere. And um, although I think it's a, it's a gesture, it's the best we can do with the information we have, I don't think that that is an effective plan without others, you know, stepping in and making some major moves. So. I don't know. I just want to say, but I just want to moderate your enthusiasm yeah. for the adaptation yeah. plan. I, I didn't realize I sounded enthusiastic, <laughs> but um, but I, I actually just, Gary, I just wanted to jump in and say I really appreciate your earlier comment about how the, I, I'm paraphrasing now, so you can correct me, but it seemed like um, you felt like the development didn't seem to quite necessarily fit in some ways in the bigger picture in terms of uh, perhaps instigating more levies and the like. And I, I think that's a really um, good comment and valid comment. I just don't know that we have figured out how to handle that yet. No. At least I, I haven't figured it out. Yet. Yeah, I, well, I guess, I guess it's good to have adaptation strategies, but 
until you really have an adaptation strategy, I think you can do it with landscaping. You can do it with the initial building, the, the you know, the architecture that we have tomorrow, not, you know, plan on something coming along to save the day in 20 years or something. Okay, good. I think that concludes our uh, board discussion. So the next item on the agenda is project proponent response and uh, would the project team like to respond to our comments? Jacinta, I'm gonna, we're confirming yes. they're coming back or you'd like to see them again? I think we would, yes. I'll keep it brief just because yeah. there's a, a lot to respond to and I obviously don't, you know, that will require much more than I'm capable of speaking to right now. First, I'll just say thank you, an extremely long list of thoughtful comments. You know, I'm impressed by your guys' sophistication as a board and as a Bay Area resident. I'm, you know, even if it's affecting me not necessarily positively in this moment as a Bay Area <laughs> resident, I'm, you know, uh, heartened to see the level of, uh, you know, sophistication that's brought to these discussions. Um, You've brought up a lot of, 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 of really good points and all of which we've, we've talked about as a team. And we came here today with a hypothesis, you know, for how we felt we might solve it while also building the project that we want to build um, that we think is viable to build the right, you know, the right product for our tenants and the right ecosystem that they're attracted to. Um, but obviously we have a little bit of work to do. And I think in all of these areas, you know, we had every expectation that there's maybe would be some tweaks to be made. So we're happy to go back and, and revisit some of these areas. Um, with building two, I think you, you know, a few of you nailed it. I mean, all of you brought it up and, you know, and I think it was mentioned that this is a pretty constrained site and, um, you know, we do need to, we can't, it's harder to just shrink, it's harder than just shrinking the floor plate, right? To shrink the building because the floor plate has to work in a certain way. And so I can't just make a smaller floor plate necessarily and then, you know, go higher. Um, and so that's what, something we've been struggling with, and we'll bring that. We'll, we'll take another look at that, and we'll bring that back to the, you know, to this board for a potential solution. And I think we can we can work on that with the with the loading area too. I heard that as a central area that we need to look at. Um, again, we had a hypothesis about how that might work, and we heard some useful feedback from you guys that's that's really actionable, um, and we can come back with another hypothesis. Um, and then the southern end, I think, is a, a different sort of challenge just because it is land that is not ours um, that interfaces with the Bay Trail. Um, it's something that we'll take a hard look at to see what we can do within our, within our project boundaries to respond to what you were suggesting. Um, and then obviously there's a lot of other comments for us to respond to. But those are you know, the, the big bullets that I took away is sort of like yeah. central areas that we need to focus on. Um, and, and we'll do it. So thanks again. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Ashley, anything else before we adjourn? There's nothing else. Okay. Well, that concludes our project review for the meeting. Uh, I would like to have a motion uh, to adjourn the meeting. I will make a motion to adjourn. Thanks, Gary. Second? Okay. Thank you, Kristen. Okay. Uh, any objections? Hearing none, the meeting is adjourned. Thanks everyone, good night, thank you.